Everybody good? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, um, you know, I love this particular moment in the church because we get to welcome in those um, that are not in the building with us, but they are with us. And so today, watching with us online, listen to this list. We have Connecticut, Delaware, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, New York, North Carolina, Texas, Puerto Rico, Illinois, South Dakota, Pennsylvania, Nevada, of course, Oklahoma, Washington State, and all over Florida. Can we give them a big round of applause as they're joining us? It's just... It boggles your mind when you think about it. Good morning and, and welcome. And, and I, wanna, I wanna thank you so much for being here. My name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor here at, at Community Life. And it is an honor to have you here. At Community Life, you've heard me say it. We love God, we love our neighbor, but we believe our mission is to connect people to Jesus because this world is just perfected the art of taking life from us. In fact, church will end and you'll get out into your car and you'll have an opportunity to lose life. Not, not literally. Oh, good, good Lord. That's not, doesn't sound good. Uh, you'll, you'll get into your car and life can be sucked out of you because you'll get frustrated. Oh, uh, I wish I could get that back. Um, <laughs> Be careful when you leave today. Uh, But we found the one that can give life back to you. And we believe that's Jesus. And so we're going to do everything we can to connect you to the source of life. We're not perfect in doing that. In fact, we have a perfect gospel in the hands of imperfect people. That's why we talk about conversations like this, because we're all broken. And um, and so that's what we're doing. We're connecting people uh, to Jesus. And, And so it's hard to believe as we stand here and as you maybe are in bed today or as you're in the family room with us, To believe that we've closed out a decade, uh, that thing just flew by. Now, for those of you who don't know, in 2009, I was appointed to Gulf Breeze United Methodist Church, which which is the church that started this campus. Um, And and they started in 2000, but I was appointed in 2009 along with uh, the Reverend Jack Kale. And then at the end of 2009, going into 2010, Jack Kale moved out to worship at the water and to to do ministry out in Pensacola Beach. And and so at the beginning of this decade, it's been 10 years of ministry for me on this stage um, here at Community Life. It's been absolutely incredible. But let me just give you some some numbers to wrestle with. So at the end of 2009, Christmas Eve service, we had 1,185 people here. And I remember thinking it was the end of the world. Uh, There were people everywhere. We had no idea how we were going to handle all those folks. And I just remember how insane that was. Now, after the end of this Christmas, 2019, uh, we had 2,317 people that joined us for that service. Isn't that amazing? Not to mention all of the families that connected online and how many ever people were joined around computers with candles right along in, in, in tow with us. Um, just an absolutely gorgeous night. Uh, in 2009, do you want to know what our church income was in 2009? Yeah, I do. Um, it was $599,000. That was the income in 2009. And this year, our budget is $2.19 million. Uh, so... Uh, and you, you guys are like, wait a minute, you didn't ask me about that. It is. And that's where we are. And Finance Committee has set that budget and we're rolling. And, and I believe it just shows how God has blessed this church and provided you with resource. And you guys are kingdom builders and you're putting that money right back in uh, to God's kingdom. And so thank you for that. That's an incredible um, amount of growth. In the last 10 years, we've baptized over 800 people. Isn't that amazing? Talk about kingdom impact. That's a, that's a lot of time in the water, y'all. Uh, just awesome. And y'all helped to make that, that possible. J- just incredible. I started the decade with an 11 and a six-year-old, <laughs> and now they are 21 and 16. I started the decade with a goatee, and now I have a fully white beard. Like, it's all, it's all going. I couldn't grow hair 10 years ago, and now it's growing out of everywhere, guys. Can you identify? Yes, in, in Jesus' name. So, um, and today we celebrate our fourth year. We launched a church somewhere in that 10 years, celebrate our fourth year as Community Life, And, you know, people always ask me, Scott, what's the word that you've chosen to use as we go into the next year? And for me, this is the year where we truly thrive. This is the year where we thrive, where we get to experience the things that God, it's not not that we haven't thrived in the past, but this is where we get to experience all the things that are in front of us. Now, you may not know this, but we're working with um, strategic planning committees. We've had a few that we've interviewed, and over these next month or few months, you're going to start hearing information about that, what these next five to 10 years will look like, because specifically 20 
I almost said 2010. Where are we at? 2020. Um, in 2020, there are, a lot, there are a lot of renovations and things that will happen right here inside of this building. All of the flooring on the, on the downstairs, all the children's ministry rooms, everything is going to be renovated. The floor that you're standing on, all of this is going to be renovated. Now, you may not know this, but what that means is that we're going to be doing church under a big top for at least two weeks in the fall. I'm not going to put y'all out there in the summer. Amen? So uh, we're going to figure all that out. But, but here's, here's what I, and, and a lot of, uh, I mean, just so many other things, the, the, the conversation about starting a, a new campus or what that looks like down towards Navarre, um, all of that that's in there. Those are just all beginning of conversations, just working through um, what this year is going to look like. When I look at the year, I think, oh, right? Like, like how is it possible that we're going to get there? Like, God, just help us to survive. And what I want you to hear today is that God doesn't want us to just survive. God wants us to thrive. God wants us to thrive. Now, there are times in life where survival means to thrive, right? Like, if you remember those days when you had two little ones at home, and I would leave, and Tammy would be in her pajamas, and I'd come home from work, and she'd still be in her pajamas, and she's like, don't you dare judge me, or I'll make you stay here, right? Like, like surviving is thriving. Well, I honestly believe that life is not about surviving. It's about experiencing everything that God has for us and truly um, thriving and moving towards the thing that God, that God has for us. And so we start a new series today called Thrive. And, and I, I want to open that up. And we just have a, we got a lot of scripture to run through, but really one big key thought that, that hinges on that understanding of, of, of thriving in our lives and not just, not just getting by. There's a greater purpose to all this. And so we're going to start by looking in Matthew chapter 4. And what we're going to talk about is verses 1 through 11. But to set the context for you, we're not going to read all of it, but to set the context for you, Jesus is right on the precipice of beginning his ministry. Like right at this, this amazing time where he's about to go into his ministry and he goes in to the wilderness. That's what we get in the beginning of Matthew chapter four. But remember, just prior to this, he is baptized by John the Baptist. And so he goes under the water and he comes up. And if you remember this beautiful um, story, the heavens open up, a dove um, sets down on him and, and, the, and the, the voice of, the, of Father God rings out and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He's the beloved. And then Jesus goes and he goes off into the wilderness to experience this moment of temptation or trial by the adversary. Now, there are really three things that he's tested at. We're going to look at the first one, but there are three things in which he's tested. He, he goes away, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights, and guess what? He's hungry. And so the adversary shows up and says, hey, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread and feed yourself. And Jesus struggles through the test of, of denying himself, but he does. He makes a decision to do what it is that God has called him to do, passes that first test. The second test, he sets him on the top of, a, of the temple there in Israel, and he looks out over all of his people, and this speaks to his desire to rule and reign over the children of Israel. Jesus makes the right choice in choosing to serve God and not taking that step and fulfilling that need or that desire that he has in his own flesh. And then finally, um, the adversary shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if, I'll give you any and all of these if you'll just bow your knee to me. And he says, get away from me, for I will only serve uh, the Lord my God. And so you see, he passes that last test, which is really speaking of his ultimate reign, that he's going to choose to live into God's design for his life. And so in all of this, we discover Christ in his wilderness, in this time of, of testing, choosing God's will over maybe his own design and his own desire for his own personal fulfillment. And it's just a beautiful part of where we're at, thinking about moving into that ministry. So we're going to read just quickly Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to go through verses 1 through 4, and we're going to talk specifically about verse 4. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. That's kind of an understatement, isn't it? As some of us, I'll speak for myself, we're hungry right now, and we're trying to figure out what, what lunch is going to be about. So imagine 40 days and 40 nights. And what that means is he literally went to the edge of himself, to the edge of life itself, um, to, to find this connection or to reveal his total compliance or total, excuse me, reliance on God. So he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, isn't it interesting that the first question that comes out is a direct challenge of what he just experienced. Now, he just had this baptism where the, the heavens open up and God speaks and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Have you ever experienced moments in life where you see the hand of God so clearly and you learn a lesson so clearly, you understand it, and then the very next day you go to work and you have to live into it? 
Like you're like, really, God? If you do believe this, then you have to live it out. It's the challenge that Jesus faces. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so in Jesus's, Jesus' response to this question, he chooses God's word, God's design, and God's direction for his life rather than doing what maybe he could do, which is to turn those stones into bread and to feed himself. But he just lets us know that it's not about particularly in this moment survival. It's about thriving or accomplishing what it is that God has set in front of him. And so to me, the big takeaway is it's not just about surviving. It's about thriving, coming to the end of who we are and experiencing God in our lives and trusting that he's going to take us on where we end and he's going to allow us to see and accomplish that which he's spoken over our lives. Now, Jesus says in this text something so interesting. He says, it is written. Now, what you discover if you go back and read this is that Jesus is drawing a parallel to a greater story that he's a part of. And so he's, he's making a connection back to the children of Israel and what they were going through in the time of, of, of this quote that he gave or, or after it when Moses wrote, and it's a connection back to Deuteronomy chapter eight. Now, remember, Jesus has gone through his baptism 40 days in the wilderness and has this temptation and this trial right before he steps into his promise or into his ministry. He connects us back to a time when Moses is writing to the Israelites after being in the wilderness for 40 years. And he's reminding them of the journey that they've gone through and the promise that they're about to experience. And so Jesus is drawing this parallel. And if you want to draw the specific parallels, they, they are led by the hand of God out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Think of that as a baptism and a connection as a people. And then through the wilderness, this time of trial where they learn and God forges them together as a people onto the edge of the promised land. And so you see how everything fits together and Jesus speaking to this larger narrative. But for the sake of the sermon today, I want to go back and, and just read through this because I believe it'll speak volumes to us as we consider going into this new decade and going into this new year. So in Deuteronomy chapter eight, if you have your Bibles and you want to flip there, it's way back towards the front, or you can follow along online. And I encourage you later to read all of the, start with Deuteronomy chapter six, read there and go all the way through chapter eight. So you get the full picture of what's being said and what Jesus is connecting us to. So Jesus is connecting us back to this story. And I'm going to pick up in chapter eight, verse two, Moses writes this. He writes, remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Remember, he's talking to him, remember the long way that we came to get to this particular point. Anybody ever look back over the years and say, it was a long way to get to where we are today? Anybody ever feel like that? I love shortcuts, but every time I try to take one, I end up taking the long way around. That's just kind of the way that goes. And this word remember is so key to our faith. So as Moses is, is talking to the Israelites, he's saying, engage your mind, remember back, think back to those moments, the last 40 years, as we navigated through this long way around in the wilderness. He goes on to say this, in order to, to humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments, he humbled you, listen to this, you have to wrestle with this. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted. So, so he, he brought you to this place of hunger, but then he also provided the provision. And so you could see the hand of God moving in your life over those last 40 years as he led the Israelites through to that place that he was there and present to them all along. In order to make you understand, and here's the quote that Jesus quoted in um, Matthew, that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so what Jesus is saying, he's connecting back to this to say, there's something bigger that's unfolding, that there's a, a bigger narrative that's unfolding, that, that we, we have had this journey all along, and for the last 40 years, or the last 40 days, or the last fill in the blank for how many years, when you look back, there has been this journey where, yes, we've survived, yes, we've walked through all of that, but you can see the hand of God doing something that goes far beyond just survival. He's bringing us to a new place. He's creating something new inside of us, and he's bringing us right to the edge of this, of this promise that's in front of us. 
Um, and, and so there's, there's more to live, fi- live for than to just for survive, that God has called us to thrive. Verse four, the clothes on your back did not wear out and your feet did not swell these 40 years. He gives us more insight in verse five. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. And so Moses is reminding them that everything that took place over those last 40 years is tracking us towards ultimately where God is bringing us. That we, when we crossed that Red Sea and we moved into this wilderness, we came to the end of ourselves and it required us trusting God to get us to this exact point. And Jesus is drawing that parallel to where he finds himself in the wilderness, literally starved to death. And verse seven to me is the key for all of this. He says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. And then he goes on to describe the promised land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters, welling up into valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley. And he goes on to describe this amazing place. But for me, the first part of that is is what's so powerful. And I'm not, I'm not one of those preachers that likes to take something that was spoken in context over someone and just lay it over everything in context. I'm not saying that we're gonna all of a sudden move into all of this, but it, it gives us the narrative and the, and the direction of the heart of God and how God operates. Um, the first part that I love that really speaks to us is this. For the Lord your God is bringing you in to a good land. The Lord your God is bringing you in. You know, in my life, I've had many opportunities to go into New Year's. Many opportunities to go into relationships, many opportunities to go into uh, different scenarios or decisions that are going to be made, many opportunities to, to step into those areas. But I want you to know that the ones that I felt most confident in, the ones where I was able to see the best in my life and the best in the lives of those that were around me were those where I allowed God to be the one that brought me in. Yes, I can survive. Yes, I can use my skill set and my ability to get to us to a certain point. But I want you to know that where the rubber meets the road is when we find the end of ourselves and we trust and we believe that the God who holds all resource, the God who holds all wisdom and insight is able to take us and move us on to the next place. It's not just about what we can accomplish in our own ability. It's what we can do with God and what God can do with the things that we have. Maybe that's a better way to say it in our lives. And so what Moses is reminding them is that God is the one that is bringing us in. And so as I think, and as I wrestle through this year and thinking about Jesus going into his ministry, thinking about the Israelites in this story, thinking about what we're looking at in in 2020, get that right, 2020, the next decade, the next few years, we can't make it if we decide to do it in and of our own strength that we need the Spirit of God to lead us and to guide us, to help us to navigate through all of the challenges that are gonna be in front of us, to help us to see another 800 plus, plus, plus people baptized over the next 10 years, to see people in this community that never even heard of God get to experience and, 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 and come to life like maybe they never have before, to become a beacon of life and hope to this community that maybe people in this community have never been able to experience before. But we can't do that on our own. It's when we come to the end of ourselves And we realize that it's not just about survival. It's about trusting God and allowing God to bring us to a place to where we can thrive. And so I ask you to consider as we move into this new year, your personal lives, your businesses, don't just lock into the things that you're able to do. Allow God to engage in your life and to bring you to a whole new place. Because I honestly believe that this is the year, this is the decade where we experience the the true thriving nature of a God that wants to see his kingdom grow. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message, for the heart of, of the way that you lead your people and this greater story and this greater narrative that we see unfolding in the children of Israel. And we see this unfolding in the the hearts of Jesus and his disciples. And we see it in our lives where we come to the end of ourselves and, and we're required to trust you for what's going to be next. God, this thing continues to unfold. And so today we make a choice to trust you. We make a choice to bring everything that we have to bear, but ultimately we do not get there unless you are the one that leads us and brings us in. And that's where we are today. God, lead us and guide us. Help us to be a church that represents your heart in a way that, that is just so beautiful. A God that, that didn't send his son into this world to condemn this world, but a God who sent his son into this world that this world might be saved. Help us to capture the true heart of that message. 
And Lord, for those who maybe haven't had a chance to believe in you today, I pray that this is the day where hearts will be yielded to you. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.